So we get to the high point of the second half of the B deduction, which is paragraph 26. And if we take Kant at his word, this is where the transcendental deduction of the universally possible use of the pure concept of the understanding in experience is going to take place. And actually, it's going to take place in just the part of paragraph 26 leading up to the first three stars. So this is very short. Let's read all of it. In the metaphysical deduction, the origin of the a priori categories in general was established through their complete coincidence with the universal logical functions of thinking. Okay, that's what the metaphysical deduction did. Uh, taught us about the origin of the categories. Nice, but not what we're after. Okay, in the transcendental deduction, that would be the first part of the transcendental deduction, um, paragraph 20 and 21, Kant tells us, their possibility as a priori cognitions of objects of an intuition in general was exhibited. So what we have already seen is that the possibility of the categories as a priori cognitions of objects of an intuition in general, that, that's what the first half of the transcendental deduction has, sh has shown. Now the possibility of cognizing a priori through categories and here is, I think, the crucial phrase. Whatever objects may come before our senses, not as far as the form of their intuition, but rather as far as the laws of their combination are concerned, thus the possibility of, as it were, prescribing the law to nature and even making the latter possible, the latter, that is nature, um, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, is to be explained. For if the categories did not serve in this way, it would not become clear why everything that may ever become before our senses must stand under laws that arise a priori from the understanding alone. So what Kant is clearly trying to do here is he is trying to show us that anything that may come before our senses must fall under the categories. right? So this worry that we have been talking about for the past two videos, the worry that, okay, when we think about objects they have to fall under the categories but how can we know in advance that the objects that appear in sensation are going to fall under the categories how where is the link between sensation and the understanding that is what we are going to have to solve here and only that will allow us to understand how it can be that we know in advance that these laws that govern the categories will also be the laws of nature. Nature, understood here, um, why does Kant say that this makes nature possible? He says that this makes nature possible because nature is for him not some random collection of things. Nature is this systematic law-governed whole. Okay. So that was just a preliminary, right? Again, telling us what has to be proven. So this transcendental deduction really is very short. First of all, I remark that by the synthesis of apprehension, I understand the composition of the manifold in an empirical intuition, through which perception that is empirical consciousness of it as appearance becomes possible. So the synthesis of apprehension is that which makes, you know, an empirical intuition um, possible, right? That which allows there to be something that is given in intuition, in sensible intuition. The synthesis of apprehension is the composition of the manifold in an empirical intuition through which perception that is empirical consciousness of it becomes possible, right? Whatever creates this unity in which an object can appear in sensibility, that is what we call the synthesis of apprehension. We have forms of outer as well as inner sensible intuition a priori in the representations of space and time. And the synthesis of the apprehension of the manifold of appearance must always be in agreement with the latter, since it can only occur in accordance with this form, the form of time, uh, or space and time, if you want to read it that way. But space and time are represented a priori not merely as forms of sensible intuition, but also as intuitions themselves, which contain a manifold, and thus with the determination of the unity of this manifold in them. Okay, what does that mean? Space and time are given not only as forms of sensible intuition, 
but also as intuitions themselves. Hmm. Okay. Now an intuition was an immediate grasp of an object. Right? And so all the empirical objects, all the objects that we grasp in sensibility are going to have the form of space and time. So space and time are forms of sensible intuition in that sense. What does it mean to say that they are also intuitions themselves? Well, there is a sense in which space and time, too, are objects that we are, you know, that are given to us. Not given like in sensation, we can't see all of space or all of time. Um, but they are still these individual entities that are sort of present or presupposed in every empirical intuition that we have. Let's read this footnote, which is certainly not unimportant. Space, represented as object, as is really required in geometry, contains more than a mere form of intuition, namely the comprehension of the manifold, given in accordance with the form of sensibility in an intuitive representation, so that the form of intuition merely gives the manifold, but the formal intuition gives unity of the representation. Right? Space is not merely this spatial form, it is also the grasp of all this form as a unity. Right? So it is something on which what we might call a synthesis of apprehension, I guess, uh, has taken place. Right? Our grasp of space requires not merely the spatial form of intuition, it requires also a synthesis that takes that everything that might fall under that form together into the grasp of this unitary space. In the aesthetic, I ascribe this unity merely to sensibility, only in order to note that it precedes all concepts. Though, to be sure, it presupposes a synthesis which does not belong to the senses, but through which all concepts of space and time first become possible. For since through it, as the understanding determines the sensibility, space or time are first given as intuitions, the unity of this a priori intuition belongs to space and time and not to the concept of the understanding. In the aesthetic... I ascribe this unity merely to sensibility. But that's not the whole story, right? That's not the whole story. Because, okay, it precedes all concepts, but it presupposes a synthesis which does not belong to the senses. So whatever the aesthetic was telling us is not the whole story. So I think Conant is right when he says that the aesthetic is not full and complete. Um, it's not telling us the whole story because it presupposes a synthesis which does not belong to the senses, but through which all concepts of space and time first become possible. This synthesis is, of course, done by the understanding. Right? It is done in the kind of way that we have learned about in the deduction here, in the previous sections. And so, space and time are not given to us in sensibility in any straightforward sense or at least not in any sense that is independent of the operations of the understanding. Because space and time, and therefore any spatio-temporal um, you know, sensation, any spatio-temporal sensation requires space and time, and space and time require this synthesis of the entire spatio-temporal manifold by the understanding. And so we know that whatever appears in space and time has already been subjected to a synthesis of the understanding. And so it would be completely false to claim that sensibility gives us objects that are independent of the understanding and to which the categories are then applied as if to something wholly alien. No, any object that might appear in sensibility is already subjected to a synthesis by the understanding. And of course we know that the understanding synthesizes through the categories, right? That's what it does. Okay, we read on um, back to, you know, the main text. Thus even unity of the synthesis of the manifold outside or within us, hence also a combination with which everything that is to be represented as determined in space or time must agree is already given a priori. 
along with, not in, these intuitions, as condition of the synthesis of all apprehension, along with the intuitions, but not in them, right? I mean, it's not the content of the intuition, like the table or whatever, that gives me this, this synthesis. No, it's given along with the intuitions. So sensible intuition is always accompanied by this synthesis that the understanding has performed. But this synthetic unity can be none other than that of the combination of the manifold of a given intuition in general in an original consciousness. Right? That's what this synthesis has to be. It has to be the synthesis of you know, space and time have to be combined. You know, what, what kind of combination? Well, combined in an original consciousness in agreement with the categories, because that's the only way, you know, in which that's what the first half of the deduction has shown us. That's the way that the understanding operates. That's the way that things are unified in this single consciousness, only applied to our sensible intuition. Consequently, all synthesis through which even perception itself becomes possible stands under the categories. All synthesis through which even perception itself becomes possible, stands under the categories. And since experience is cognition through connected perceptions, the categories are conditions of the possibility of experience and are thus also valid a priori of all objects of experience. And that's it. All right. Okay, let's, let's say that once more. What does this second part of the deduction amount to? It amounts to Kant pointing out that space and time themselves require a synthesis of apprehension. They require a manifold being taken up into the unity of consciousness so as to yield this unitary grasp of space, which is this one unitary thing, right? Object in some broad sense of the word. And time, which is this one unitary object. And space and time are presupposed in every sensation that we have, right? These sensations are not even possible without space and time. So space and time themselves require a synthesis that brings them into the unity of their perception. And we know that that kind of synthesis is connection through the categories. And so space and time are irrevocably connected to the categories. Space and time are unthinkable without the categories. They cannot be pried apart from the categories. And so the idea that there could be objects of sensibility that are completely alien to the categories on which the categories would have to be imposed is false. And the idea that the categories have a priori validity for anything that could appear to us in space and time, that is right. And that is precisely what the transcendental deduction wanted to show. All right, and that's it. Okay, there are a couple of pages and we'll take a look at them, but that is sort of it. This is the end of the transcendental deduction. Uh, Kant wants to say some more things. He wants to tell us, well, I think what he especially wants to tell us is that, um, you know, what this clarifies is the meaning of the claim that we prescribe laws to nature, right? Because, okay, the categories sort of, we're gonna learn a little bit later on, you know, what kind of laws the category, I mean, the categories are just kind of concepts, right? So they don't really involve laws, but we're gonna find out that they are, that they are, you know, involved in certain laws. That's, um, that's going to be the next part of the book, the um, analytical principles. So we're going to find out that, 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 you know, describing something in terms of the categories is actually describing it in terms of some kind of law-like framework. How is it possible that the categories of the understanding prescribe laws to nature? Well, it's possible because nature is this thing that appears in space and time, and space and time are always already um, structured by the categories and their law-like structure. Right? And so, of course, nature has to follow the law, the categorical laws of our understanding. And we are really, in some sense, the lawgivers to nature. And of course, all of this is only possible if nature is not a thing in itself, but if it is appearance, 
which is precisely what transcendental idealism has been telling us. So again, paragraph 27 gives us a result uh, in which Kant emphasizes once more that, um, that we cannot apply you know, all these, these categories, all these types of knowledge outside of the realm of possible experience. Uh, he spends a little bit of time attacking Leibniz with his pre-formation system. That would basically be Leibniz's idea of uh, pre-established harmony where Kant basically entertains for a moment the idea that, you know, we might have categories in the mind and God has created the world in such a way that our categories and the structure of the world just happen to be the same structure. And Kant says, well, you know, that would make a mockery of the necessity of the categories. Strictly speaking, I think he should say that, you know, this is no longer a possible hypothesis once you, are, once you have been convinced of transcendental idealism. Uh, and he ends with a very, very, very brief summary. Well, that was the B deduction. And with that, I would say we have finished and survived the hardest part of the book. So from now on, it will be easy. No, who am I kidding? Um, from now on, it will be slightly less hard.